Welcome to the Nerman Museum Day of Creativity 2021. I'm Catherine Morse, the Education Coordinator at the Nerman Museum of Contemporary Art. We're very pleased to have guest artist Rodolfo Meron speaking with us today about his work and process. And we'd like to thank our funders, the Jadel Family Foundation, for generously sponsoring this event. And with that, I will turn it over to Rodolfo. All right, let's get this going again. This should be exciting. Uh, it's actually been very exciting. It's been very pleasing to sort of revisit um, this body of work after maybe about five years or six years at this point of sort of uh, creating and completing it. Um, I was very interested in revisiting this theme and sort of how it applies to my practice now. I think my practice has uh, changed quite a bit in my eyes uh, in terms of subject matter and the way that I've chosen to sort of ground myself and how I sort of talk about community, uh, sort of social uh, constructs and identity for myself. And so I, it was important for me to kind of step back into um, a conversation about my practice and sort of acknowledge the uh, native and indigenous folks of this land. So um, I really encourage folks to sort of uh, read through and to kind of, um, you know, uh, look into uh, this land that they inhabit. I think for me, that was something very important. Um, in 2000, around 2015, I was very interested in um, the city that I lived in and sort of collecting and forging these objects uh, or, and materials in my practice. Uh, there was this sort of need for me to understand like where I was from. And that was just as simple as, you know, walking down the street and seeing like a wildflower and sort of plucking that and taking that for my own uh, personal use. And after enough time, I had accumulated uh, an abundance of weird things that sort of people would uh, gift me as well on top of uh, just sort of finding out in nature. And that sort of became the uh, focal point of this exhibition that I did at the Nerman which was titled uh, Poke Ghost in the Garden of Tears. Um, I had started using natural materials uh, such as uh, mulberry, elderberry, pokeberry, walnuts. Um, shoot, what else did I use? Uh, Brazil wood, uh, cochineal, uh, which are little bugs that grow on cacti in Mexico. They give off this really beautiful crimson color. Um, uh purple corn and hibiscus so uh just kind of being informed by this sort of uh uh cultural background but also where i kind of grew up and just noticing all these like um things on the side of the road and wanting to sort of uh dive into those things and understand them a bit more uh, was very crucial um during this time, a great friend of mine who was an advocate of my artwork and, you know, just supportive and a really great friend of mine passed away. His name is Tony Bernal. Um, and I loved him deeply and I felt really sort of lost. I had this great opportunity to present a body of work to the Nerman Museum, my first kind of like solo showing and losing Tony right before this happened really had me questioning sort of my own permanence uh, or my own belonging and this idea of impermanence. And I think that's the crux of like where all these materials sort of come into play. Um, you can see in this shot here and perhaps in other uh, detailed shots, there are pressed flowers, there are insect wings, um, the utilization of those sort of uh, mixed berries to create this uh, specific spectral creature that I created called the poke ghost, um, which was a mixture of poke berries and uh, other 
synthetic and uh, natural materials. And the POCO sort of came into existence in terms of thinking about sort of my own volatile nature and the sort of need to kind of heal uh, during this time. So poke berries, if you don't know, are poisonous um, to most animals. Um, so I don't advise eating them. They look luscious and they have a really beautiful color, but that's what attracted me to them was sort of being able to sort of just spot them, um, you know, in backyards or on the side of the road, you know, whenever I would go hiking or walking around Kansas City, um, sort of just seeing these things just sprawled about um, and very curious as to what they were. Um, so this idea of something sort of being poisonous and uh, was really uh, interesting, but there was also like this uh, kind of uh, medicinal uses that uh, poke berries were being used for um, at the time when I sort of looked at, uh, was researching them and, and interested in them, I believe having medicinal uses and trying to uh, find cures for specific ailments, I thought that was very beautiful and it made me want to sort of dive further into this like natural pigments and, and sort of what could I bring from the earth uh, into my own hands and into my own uh, practice. Um, but in the story of the Pope ghost in the Garden of Tears um, is also rooted in a, what I consider a legend here in Kansas City. There was a deer named Ella that lived in a cemetery um, kind of off of Truman Road and uh, close to Benton uh, Boulevard or maybe uh, a little further down. Uh, but the story of Ella was she was an orphan deer um, that lived in the cemetery. And when folks would go and visit their deceased loved ones, they would often encounter Ella sort of just roaming about. And in around 2014, I believe, or somewhere around then, she was shot and killed. Uh, by someone who wasn't aware of sort of her presence uh, as, as part of this sort of cemetery. Um, and I thought that was also very poetic. The deer or the doe was a creature that I had already assigned to myself in some spiritual sense or just something that I resonated with. And it felt very fitting during this time of tragedy and loss. Um, so I kind of, once again, was interested in like folklore and, and storytelling and taking this very specific creature that is native to uh, Kansas City and adapted and, and gave her a little bit more life uh, uh, along with um, my late friend. So the Pope ghost um, kind of goes through these different metamorphoses of, of self-realization and healing. Um, in some of these, you can see the Pope ghost sort of adorn itself with um, like butterfly wings and a veil of cicada wings. There was a couple of um, moth wings as well. So each piece, uh, each insect had its sort of its importance in terms of depicting where that character was at that time in terms of being released, uh, sort of uh, in waiting and, and wanting love and sort of burning up to your own sort of uh, desires. Um, and that for the Pocos was to sort of find uh, uh, a friend that it sort of seeked in Ella. So yeah, it was, it was really great to kind of create my own sort of mythos. Um, and it was a wonderful experiment. You can see a lot of uh, deer motifs. There's some hooves in there, which I you know, the hooves I actually found, uh, was, uh, bought online, did not find those myself. There's usually some jokes about that. But even here, you can sort of see uh, these little deer feet just kind of uh, hanging at the bottom. And I kind of wanted it to be a little mystical and sort of not make sense with like uh, directly above it. Ooh, there's the beagle barking. Um, uh, with like this motif of like, uh, like a milkweed skirt <laughs> and then the poke goes sort of just drenching with this like beautiful monarch and this pressed flower um interesting enough the the use of pressing flowers i know has uh it's 
uh, roots and sort of uh, sort of documenting different species of flowers. And for me, uh, it was used to document certain trips and experiences that I had with my specific loved ones, which many of them were with Tony. Um, so they became like little capsules where I could remember exactly like where I got this specific um, pressed wildflower or flower and immediately I uh, would put it in my sketchbook that I carried around with me everywhere and yeah I wanted to sort of give into that fantasy and making them scepters and making them crowns and these sort of ordinary things that we pass by every day kind of having this uh, regal and ethereal nature um, and really kind of thinking about once again like how can I utilize these materials because for a very long time I had uh, various insect wings. I worked at a cabinetry shop and for some reason there was always some kind of insect that would get caught up in the dust there and I would find them dead. So <laughs> I, I started to just be very curious, the delicate nature of them, the beautiful colors. Um, and after a while, sort of collecting enough of them where I wanted to transform them and give them more life, to, uh, which seemed very fitting. Um, you know, here we see various plants, uh, plant life, uh, bird's nests that I found. Uh, I believe inside of the bird nets, there were uh, turquoise stones. Um, there was just so much that I tried to pack in, in terms of just things that I was collecting. I believe actually the thistles that you see there, um, I found on the side of the road uh, in Johnson County. The thistles are were another thing that I just, it's like my favorite flower, which is weird because it's a weed and it's an, uh, you know, an invasive, aggressive weed and it's very prickly. It's not very cute, but I think they're, they're really beautiful, the color of them, um, which they also have medicinal uses. And, you know, as I started to collect like Queen Anne's lace and elderberries, like understanding that these were materials meant for healing. And I think, you know, uh, this work certainly uh, was looking at the fragility of nature and of life and playing with um, what fades and what decays and what stays. Uh, so yeah, a lot of these, pig some of these natural pigments um, are fugitive, will fade over time. And that's something that I did contemplate for a second. You know, I know the, uh, archivist of museums are like shaking their head at me, but it was really important for me to kind of just let that go. Uh, here you can see uh, mortar and pestle with some berries um, that I had grounded up and was using. That's kind of one, a more simpler way that I would extract sort of pigment from um, these materials, uh, specifically pokeberries, elderberries, and mulberries, which, you know, for the most part you could find just walking around in Kansas City. And I didn't own a car, I still don't own a car. So I always walked everywhere and that's how I got, you know, my resources. As I called foraging, just to kind of make it sound like more new age and I guess cool than just like a trash collector. But I'll own a trash collector too. Um, So the, the accumulation of, I think these were about 21 pieces um, that were created for, uh, 21 pieces on paper were uh, accompanied by these four different vignettes and these four different vignettes like held um, different objects from family uh, that I had collected from family, gifts that were given to me by friends and sort of my own collection. So it really was this sort of uh, love note uh, to my great friend um, and a really amazing way to immortalize him in uh, in works and also the acquisition of these works at the Nerman. Um, and just, you know, more, uh, and I had, as I had uh, completed that exhibition, I was still, you know, working with these materials uh, prior to the uh, Pope Ghost series and continued on. And I even took a trip to, I believe, um, maybe like South, 
southeast Kansas, and I was able to find a, a brood of cicadas. This was the 18-year brood, so they specifically have gold wings and red eyes, where I think the normal ones had this sort of kind of army green and sort of gray wings. Um, and I found even this little husk sort of attached to the twig uh, while I was hiking, and I just kind of, you know, just being a weirdo and just wanted these for myself to sort of uh, use at a later point. Um, I think this is here an example of the mulberry, which I don't remember where I got that from, but Lord knows it was probably someone's yard or, <laughs> you know, just on some trail. Um, and this kind of continued for uh, a little while longer um, in, uh, in terms of just continuing this sort of same uh, process of uh, collecting and using these materials uh, specifically uh, within my practice. Here you can sort of see, uh, I think these were pokeberries. Uh, yes, uh, that stained my hands. And I just loved that color and just, you know, I tried to handle them with enough caution, but this was obviously for like a Instagram photo moment just to kind of show what I was doing in studio and um, yeah, uh, the pokeberries didn't tra uh, didn't uh, transition too much into this work, but I think still thinking about ideas of impermanence and and definitely the materials that I was uh, that I was using um, still gave way uh, to. Um, to what I wanted to express and evidently what sort of came to fruition during the um, Monarchs exhibition that very thankfully uh, very uh, landed back here in Kansas. So a place that I was very familiar with. Um, so yeah, these two shots that, um, that we're uh, seeing here, the piece that is mine is the uh, freestanding wall that has the turquoise color. Um, and there is an abundance of information uh, sort of tacked on there literally and like with thumbtacks because that's how I roll um, uh, within that uh, specific install. And I think what's a very interesting uh, transition in terms of that sort of work that I was doing uh, was that I think my work always kind of operates out of this place of like it being this cathartic process. And so for me, instead of grieving about my friend who had passed, I was thinking about other ways that I was grieving. Um, you know, I've been open enough with this. Um, my sister was incarcerated at that time and kind of, and Trump was rearing his head you know, think, you know, that's past. Um, so yeah, these things certainly made me uh, look at my family and their own sort of identity as uh, immigrants um, and their own positions and how they would sort of be viewed. Um, and when my sister was incarcerated, there was this sort of moment that I had uh, in myself where I was grieving you know, I, I wasn't able to see her very often and, and talk to her. So there was this private moment in my studio where I tried to like reach, uh, reach her through making art. She was an artist herself. And this is something uh, that I contemplated when I was sort of um, going up for this uh, Charlotte Street Award. You know, sort of what was, well, uh, what perspective did I have that, you know, maybe some of these, these other artists that were applying didn't have? And that was this uh, abundance of information coming from, like, my cultural background. I mean, once I started using this uh, turquoise color, I've had a lot of uh, Latinx uh, folks tell me how that color was present in their grandmother's house or just how, like, they totally resonate with... Uh, with the color scheme or the objects. And, you know, even here, this piece is a slight um, homage to the women in my life. Um, and my, uh, 
like the milkweed sort of being a, a food source for like um, monarchs. And I, uh, I think in one of the previous images we saw a monarch, you know, my mother, uh, mother is from Michoacan, which is where the monarchs migrate, um, you know, between um, and where uh, they're at in that beautiful, abundant forest. I always think if I go to that forest, I'm just going to find so many dead monarchs on that ground and I hope I can take them, which <laughs> is weird, but I've got my bag ready. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so yeah, the, this idea of nature still, you know, uh, was creeping into my work and, and existing in my work, just maybe in different ways. Um, and, and more so being these very subtle, uh, informers of my family and my cultural background and sort of how that manifested its way into these crazy, uh, weird and now creepy, uh, works. And I say that because I'm looking at that scorpion, which I do not like, but I used it. And it's probably why it was in kind of bad shape. Cause when I would handle it, I was just so freaked out by it and <laughs> wanted nothing to do with it, but I thought it was cool. Um, and yeah, I guess I was still collecting bugs this time. Not so cute and not so desired, but I guess someone desires scorpions. My brother did. Um, but this, uh, this uh, exoskeleton actually came from my brother Adolfo, uh, and he just had, uh, he had this period where he was just collecting and, and keeping as pets, like a lot of these weird exotic animals, like uh, lizards and spiders and uh, this scorpion, and I just hated it. But I found this exoskeleton, um, and I just, and I took it and I decided to use it in my own practice. Um, you know, uh, interesting enough, there, uh, my brother, uh, David, was deported um, back in 2007. And something that re uh, that sort of clicked uh, around the time that I was uh, working um, on this specific piece, I was having a conversation with him. And he was telling me in the little like, uh, pueblo that he lives in, and Michoacan, how they have to uh, watch out for the scorpions. Um, I had a little nephew who has my, uh, my namesake. So there's another, uh, Rodolfo somewhere out there in Mexico. Uh, but he was telling me how he would have to like watch out with the kids and be careful with the kids because they were scorpions and, you know, they would sting them. And then here was my other brother sort of just keeping one as a pet. So I thought there was this very interesting, uh, conversation that was happening or this very interesting comment that could be made. Um, because this specific installation that you were seeing, um, Mitrokanex, is um, was inspired by both my mother and my uh, brother, because they're both from uh, Caracuaro, Mitrokan. And so I really tried to think about the sort of like feminine energy and this masculine energy and was bringing them together through different motifs uh, and vignettes, um, collected and found objects once again, uh, family photographs, hand created, works on paper. Um, and yeah, I, I really wanted to specifically uh, create this, uh, this moment for both of them to sort of exist together because at this time my brother is still deported. Um, and for the most real part, I'm not sure when he'll come back and if he'll ever come back. So this was a really great way once again for me after so many years of him being absent to kind of revisit and to connect with him and having conversations with him and also with my mother um, just to kind of continue to engage and inform myself of, of what they've sort of been through and sort of their own journey and their own interest as well and what they love. And my mother loves plants and she loves insects. Um, it's been interesting to see how I've had a mild um, influence on my family. Now, when I go to my mother's house, I will see she's collected uh, cicadas and has put them in her little plants. Um, and we kind of now share that. Um, my affinity and love for plants and flowers, you know, came from her. Um, 
and yeah, this, this was a really amazing moment to kind of have it travel back to Kansas. I was able to bring my mother out and have her sort of see the installation herself. Um, and a lot of it she didn't get, but you know, that's how parents are, I guess. And a lot of my work is conceptual. So it's already a little hard to follow or it can be a reach, <laughs> but um, it was great to have her in that space and sort of to call back to these ideas of like domesticana and rascuache, which are, you know, practices within the Latinx community that, you know, rascuache is based off of sort of, it can be kitschy, it can be tacky. It's sort of like utilizing what you have, it, you know, what some folks might see as low brow. And that's something that I always kind of uh, had to contend with, even when I was painting with berries and, and these other materials that weren't like expensive art materials that you would get at the, you know, um, a Utrecht or I guess it's Blick now. Um, and so, yeah, uh, even the paper in which I would paint on, I would go to thrift stores and thinking about like, uh, the repurposing of these books and sort of giving them new life. Um, I always thought about sort of the value of some of these works or, or sort of the, um, like where they sort of stood in terms of just like, um, I guess their, their value or, or sort of importance um, through like a more critical, uh, artistic lens, I'm looking at more specific cultural and familial stories. I am sort of looking at how I operate in the world and how I can sort of have some kind of uh, influence or what my participation is in sort of adding to the canon of Chicanx, Latinx um, artists, um, even specifically here in the Midwest and in Kansas City. Um, and sort of approaching um, this, these works, regardless of uh, if it was the work that I was creating in high school or the work at the Nerman uh, that I did for the Poco series or what I'm doing now, there's always been this sort of level of fun and experimentation that I've uh, allotted myself. Um, and also just to kind of be resourceful uh, uh, using what I have at my disposal, you know, before I made works that were like teeny tiny and there might be some folks that might remember the super small Rudy work. Um, and that was out of necessity as well. Space was a real thing before I ever had a studio, I would go to coffee shops and work there. I couldn't afford like the expensive gouache and acrylics that everyone had. So the, the berries came almost out of, uh, out of a mutual sort of necessity to um, be able to have an abundance of materials, um, the plants. I mean, they all obviously stem from a much more deeper and emotional way, but I definitely um, enjoy looking at things that are already readily available uh, and around me and utilizing those to sort of make works. Um, even if now that looks like, you know, my brother's old tennis shoes that I cover in plaster and maybe dip some Cheetos on top. We'll, we'll see. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been great to sort of be like my own, um, be like, uh, this sort of, uh, exploring, uh, my own sort of narrative and, and the way that I've chosen to approach these materials and in my general practice.